On the 8th of June 2020, I was viewing footage of the Colston statue toppling from the day prior. Watching in awe and admiration as the slave owner's legacy tumbled into Bristol Harbour, I suddenly found myself with a whimsical acoustic guitar track stuck in my head. Soon, I remembered where I'd heard it before. In the video essay series Unraveled, made for the games journalism site Polygon, Brian David Gilbert used the song as a backing track of him throwing himself in the ocean. Of course. Immediately, I went back to find that clip and identified the song using Shazam, so that I could listen and laugh as Colson's unfortunate but not undeserving vast effigy tumbled into the water. And I thought that'd be the end of it. But a few days later, I was watching the newest episode of Unraveled when another song caught my interest an energetic synth-laden 80s number. Once again, I used Shazam to find this song, and then listened to it again and again that weekend while doing chores. But when the next episode dropped, nothing could have prepared me for what happened. Seriously? That set my mind rolling. I thought back to past episodes of Unraveled, and was struck with the realisation. A lot of the music in that series? Rules. And yet, Despite endless comments about particular songs people liked, no one had really sat down to try and find them. So I thought, what if I have a go? It's a series with a passionate audience, so maybe there are other people out there who are also interested in having these songs. Even if just to be chores. <laughs> To start things off, I had to go back through each episode and decide what tracks would and wouldn't count. I chose to only include tracks when their audio was used in episode, thus saving us from the terror of Wanderwall, and only then if the tracks themselves were shazamable. I noted every time that a track could be heard by itself, and I shazammed as I went along. This netted me a staggering 20 songs. At the same time, I picked out songs which were either recognisable from popular culture or which were originally composed for the series, such as In the Navy or The Perfect Poker App. This added uh, another 12 songs. When that stopped being effective, I made a bold move. Through completely normal means, I grabbed an MP3 from every then released episode of Unraveled, which I assembled into one big playlist and left my phone to auto shazam it while I took a break. When I returned many hours later, it had turned up one song, which was wrong. This left me no choice. It was time to remove the biggest source of interference. With Audacity's vocal remover feature, I was able to excise speech from all of the episodes, leaving just the music behind. With this method alone, Shazam roped in 80 tracks. But this still wasn't enough. With 24 episodes at the time, multiplied by roughly 8 songs per episode, the number of songs totaled 190, and some of these songs were too niche even for Shazam. Oh, there had to be something I wasn't picking up on, some common thread. And then... I saw it. Going through the songs I'd found, the letters KPM kept popping up again and again on the cover art. This turned out to be a library of British stock music spanning from the 60s onwards, which included those songs. It also took me straight to APM, an American music library that supplies music to those willing to pay. Including Polygon. To make sure, I compared APM's archived versions of the aria Vesti la Juba to the one heard in Waluigi Unraveled, and found a match. And then they confirmed it themselves during a Twitch stream. APM is the place where we license our music from. Now I was familiar with enough names from my current finds, I could comb through APM's archives and cross-reference the songs I knew with their source albums, in case any others were used. With these methods combined, I managed to find over 140 songs as of November 2020. I want to give a quick shout out to some people who helped track down songs for me. Pidgewins on Discord for Manhattan Beach March, DW Venture on Twitter for Two in Harmony, uh, Ian Sonnabend for locating the entire album Tutti Flutti Swing Band for his own video essay on Unravel, and uh, Ryan David Gilbert for supplying me with uh, Disco Glitz and Trucking CB. 
The thing is though, while I'd been collating all of these songs throughout 2020, I couldn't help but notice some thematic patterns emerging. Certain similarities in song choice. The first three episodes mostly used the 2003 album Tutti Flutti Swing Band, which has cheery imitations of 60s style swing. It's this whimsical sound that really defines the start of Unraveled. Episode 4, Castlevania's Hottest Monster, delves into songs from the jazz minouche genre, with examples such as Guitar Musette from the album- Oh god, uh, no, I- Look, I did read up on this, and sources differ as to whether this word counts as a slur, but just to be on the safe side, I've stuck some resources in the description. Please help combat anti-traveller discrimination if you're able to. Anyway. Unraveled's next episode on Super Smash Bros. OSHA violations starts out with another typical Tutti Flutti track, but then the music stops. There's a pause, and then... This hard-hitting, authentically 80s, synth-laden corporate pop exemplifies what would go on to become Unraveled's defining sound. This and the Game of the Year episode mainly utilise these three albums, all of which were produced in the 80s and use similar taglines to describe the album's concept. Eleven episodes strongly use this 80s sound, with one or two appearing in other episodes when needed. Of course, this is far from the only genre. Pick from any episode and you could hear Verdi, or Leon Cavello, or military marching bands, or 90s pop, or the theme tune from This Is Your Life? Huh. What I'm saying is that there is a range of music. However, the sheer prevalence of corporate pop in Unraveled is so strong that it makes me wonder... Why is it so prevalent? To clarify, when I'm talking about corporate pop, I'm using a definition similar to that given by the online publication Professional Composers. This music will primarily be used in corporate media productions as background music to increase the quality, value and impact of a commercial, presentation video, and so on. I'm going on a brief historical tangent here, but bear with me. The emphasis of corporate pop is to bring to mind an aspirational future which in the 1980s was strongly influenced by both Reagan and Thatcher pushing for greater market freedom within their respective countries. The result of their actions is a divided world with staggering income inequality and the looming crisis of climate change. This is not the promised future for all, just for a select few who benefit. Similarly, Unraveled often starts with a lofty premise, and then over the course of the episode, it, the premise unravels until it becomes clear that the goal wasn't tenable in the first place. Obviously this is a big stretch, and I wouldn't presume to guess Brian's intent. It just feels appropriate that someone with a reputation for having socially progressive viewpoints would use music from an era famous for having strong neoliberal leanings. But aside from that, the music is really, really good, and it exemplifies the style of parody that Unraveled excels in. Unraveled's music and content tend to juxtapose in humorous ways. However, as in later episodes narrative structures became more common, there was an increased push to have the music reflect these narrative choices. A prominent example is the episode Kirby, which strongly utilises a 70s easy listening sound with high voices and soft flutes, possibly to emphasise Kirby's sweet and childish nature. This episode can be split into three parts. July 2019, January 2020 in studio, and the Wilderness Sabbatical as the final part. The first two parts utilise a very similar story structure, which starts with a declaration of intent, then a building confidence as the ideas develop, and then a breakdown in concept as holes appear in the idea's logic. We'll get to the wilderness part later. Going back to the first two thirds of the episode, each beat of the story structure has its own unique song or songs. But while July 2019 has a much more whimsical tone, January 2020 has a much more serious sound to imply that maybe we're getting into serious business. I want to focus for a moment on two songs. 
Swingle Song and Gentle Persuasion, both by Keith Mansfield. They're both used to bookend the breakdown in concert scene in both July 2019 and January 2020. But while they're used for a similar purpose, the tone couldn't be more wildly contrasting. Swingle Song is a light and silly track full of non-lexical vocals and it perfectly complements the humorous descent into madness seen in the end of July 2019. Gentle Persuasion is slower and steadier in contrast, with strings and soft la-la-las being used to reflect a quieter but more profound breakdown. They are also in the same key of A minor and perform the same switch at the end from A minor to A major. This is a technique known as the Picardy th sorry, the Picardy third. In Western culture, we are somewhat conditioned to associate major keys with happier songs and minor keys with sadder songs. So with this in mind, a Picardy third can be read as a sadder song ending on a happier note. If we apply this to how the songs are used in the Kirby episode, then Swingle Song ending on a Picardy third could emphasise the humorous nature of BDG throwing a fit over a children's video game character. In contrast, the same technique as used in Gentle Persuasion offers almost a ray of hope after he begins doubting himself. The hope that there might be an answer to the mystery of Kirby somewhere in the third and final part of the episode. The Wilderness Sabbatical opens with May by Milan Pilar, which retains the same flute sound as other songs used previously in the episode, but is much more stripped back and means that the song is much more melancholy and bittersweet. This may have been chosen to convey the hopelessness of BDG's journey into the woods, desolate and bare of leaves, and the further existential crisis contained within. This time the song starts and ends in C minor, without the hopeful lift of a Picardy third to alleviate it as BDG stumbles hopelessly through the woods and the episode fades to black. Then an ambient and atmospheric track plays during his revelation on the beach, with a soft blown bottle melody in F major conveying the quiet realisations he has. It's a subtle and beautiful track, which complements the cinematography. And no amount of searching has let me find it! <sighs> this episode ends with Play the Game by Keith Mansfield, with its light and cheerful tone emphasising BDG comically missing the point of his own epiphany as the episode returns to the place where it was at the start. Back to the start of the wait a minute. Going into the unknown? Facing challenges and temptations? experiencing the abyss and rebirth, and then returning to the point of origin? Oh, for fuck's sake, it's just the hero's journey again, isn't it? <laughs> now, I know better than to try and haphazardly cram stories into the hero's journey, but the point I'm trying to make is that these songs are being deliberately chosen to fit a narrative structure at a time when Unraveled's episodes were becoming more narratively driven. However, we must keep in mind that Unraveled is just one series among many made for a video games journalism website, which itself is part of a larger media conglomerate, which in the end their vested interest is their own bottom line. Similarly, the library music in Unraveled was composed to be generic because the production companies who hired the musicians, often for a fixed rate, wanted to make a profit selling those tracks to those who can't afford to make their own music. But it feels unfair to call library music purely financially motivated. I wanted to find out more about this, so I went online to research more about library music, and I found Unusual Sounds, The Hidden History of Library Music by David Hollander. It's a remarkably comprehensive book, and the blurb reads, Unusual Sounds is a deep dive into a musical universe that has, until now, been accessible only to producers and record collectors, a celebration of this strange industry, and an examination of its unique place at the nexus of art and commerce. Now, art and commerce aren't unfamiliar concepts to the Polygon team either. In fact, they have 
discussed whether their own work counts as art or commerce in the Wavelength episode of Overboard. Realising that Polygon and the library of music it uses both have similar conversations surrounding the subject, I decided to compare Polygon's approach to that described by Hollander in his research on the library music industry. The book starts with an introduction by George A. Romero, best known as the director of the Night of the Living Dead films and a prolific user of library music in his own right. In it, he says, It is difficult, almost impossible, to communicate an idea, your idea, which comes from deep inside you somewhere, to another artist. But I remember culling through those library tracks and selecting exactly the music that I felt was right for each specific scene in the film. No communication required, no translating. He then went on to say, I'm here to testify that the unknown, unsung artists who compose, conduct and perform library tracks are heroes. Without a script, they imagine love and hate, enmity and friendship, salvation and damnation, and are able to express them in the most abstract of mediums. Hollander himself also observed, Without the pressure to generate hits, young library composers were free to play around and experiment, and they took full advantage. Genres were spliced, conventions dispensed with, and oftentimes hybrid music of astonishing complexity was produced. But Hollander then went on to point out some shortcomings. On the other hand, originality was not exactly encouraged. The producers mandated that if a certain kind of music existed, there had to be a library analogue of it. They even ordered the creation of soundalikes of popular tunes. He then discusses the difficulties that he himself has faced in attempting to locate even more obscure library music. The majority of the best vintage library tracks have not been digitised, and most likely never will be. In the eyes of the massive corporations who hold the rights for these records, if the music hasn't yet been synchronised, it never will be. Many companies just don't see the point of archiving dead assets. As part of the process of writing the book, Hollander interviewed multiple library composers, including the previously mentioned Keith Mansfield. Mansfield is a prolific composer who features heavily on Unraveled soundtrack, and is also responsible for some of the most iconic themes in British television of all time, including both Wimbledon and Grandstand. In the interview, he brings up a candid observation on one unfortunate side effect of library music licensing. It's ironic, because some of the composers, some wonderful musicians, were very political. No problem with that. But usually if they were political, they were left-wing. And I remember one of these composers, in America his music was being used by the Republican Party, and he wanted to ban it. Well, you can't do that. We have no what we call moral right over our music. Once it's in our library, anybody can use it for whatever they want. The person who has written it has no control at all, nor does the publisher. So you've given away your moral right once you're writing for library music. This quote points towards a wider issue with commercialised art, that the will of the creator must always cede to the interests of profit. Of course, Polygon is steeped in this commercial aspect as well. Intel and Alienware are both common sponsors of Polygon's videos, and both Riot Games and Activision have directly sponsored an episode of Unraveled each. Riot previously was sued over accusations of gender discrimination, and Brian was at the time criticised for their sponsoring him. As well as this, during 2020 a wage freeze occurred in the company, preventing its income inequality from being addressed despite the best effort of Vox Media Union and its members. Employees were transparent about their salary on Twitter in order to highlight this wage discrepancy and to stand in solidarity with their co-workers. But, as of the time I'm recording this, the wage freeze has yet to be lifted. However, while the subject matter of Polygon's videos is inherently limited to video and board games, the producers are encouraged to connect these topics to the wider world, often in surreal ways. In particular, Unraveled melds video game lore with parodic levels of academia, exposing the flaws in that level of overzealous thinking. And yet, Unraveled is allowed to experiment outside of the bounds of its original premise. Waluigi and Kirby are solo performance dramas. The Sims and Halo episodes are meditations on isolation and detachment. The perfect poker rap is 20 minutes of live stand-up ending on an 8 minute musical number. 
Working on this playlist and this research over many months has helped me get a better understanding and appreciation for the work that these musicians put into library music and the effort that goes into their range of diverse sounds. Both Polygon and these musicians whose work they license seem to separately experience the balancing act between creativity and profit. Sadly, I worry that my own observations on Polygon are a little too conjecture-based compared to the research that Hollander put in or the lived experiences of people like Keith Mansfield. The year carried on, with every new release of an Unraveled episode meaning more songs for me to have to identify and put in my playlist. Eventually, I reached a stage sometime in December where I hadn't found a single song for months, not even from the latest episodes. This was becoming a problem. I had started making this playlist for fun, and now I was falling so far behind on it that I knew I'd be trying to complete it forever. I mean, how can I even make this video if it wasn't even finished. But then, on the 28th of December 2020, the Pokemon Edibility Unraveled was released. Ryan David Gilbert then took to Twitter to announce that this would be the final Unraveled, and that he had left Polygon to become an independent creator. Of course, the final episode has a strong 80s corporate thread running through it, and true to form, the episode becomes a meta-commentary on the very nature of Unraveled, as an argument against reading too deeply into creative works. Which, uh, <laughs> no one would accuse me of doing. You know, it's funny. From what I saw of Polygon and their art commerce struggle, I had maybe a vague sense that Brian would grow tired of it and choose to leave, but I guess I didn't think I would see it while I was still working on this video. To give you a timescale, I started drafting this script on the 2nd of December, which is less than a month prior, and sure, it's a little sad that it ended. I'm a little sad that it ended, but it's important that it ended. While I was having all of these thoughts and observations, I was still continuing trying to find songs for the previous episodes. There was a real chance that had it just kept going, I would have been stuck trying for as long as the episodes continued. As it was, I watched the episode, I processed it, and yeah, then I sat down and found all the songs. So regardless of whether I do find all of the other songs or not, there is at least a definitive end to the playlist, and to my research. A full stop. Or so I thought, because three weeks later, Brian David Gilbert went on to MinMax interviews hosted by Ben Hansen, and wouldn't you know it, Brian had quite a lot of things to say about his time at Polygon. Much of the interview discusses the creative aspects of making Unraveled, including the fact that it is fictionalized. Unraveled Brian is the character. It's obviously not what I actually am in real life. Uh, and like, it, it's, it allows us to have that kind of distance into like, oh, sometimes what's funnier is if Brian looks like an absolute dunce and, or, or it seems like a jerk. Like it's, it's funnier and better for the story if we make Brian look worse. Additionally, he also outright states that Unraveled became a more narrative medium thanks to the team editing it together. I think we would have been stuck on the like, Skyrim and Zelda ones for way longer, like that kind of style for longer had I not gotten to the point where we could have story editing come in and like make it cohesive and interesting and like allowed me to create stuff like the Waluigi one where it's lore, it's not very lore heavy, but it is like arc heavy. Remarkably, he also mentions being given a lot of leeway when it comes to working against the interests of his own sponsors. There were moments when I was like, is this exactly the kind of stuff I want to make? But there were also moments when I was like, I can't believe I'm getting away with this. Like, yeah. I can't believe what I have done for Crash Bandicoot is essentially talk about how nostalgia is a trap and you shouldn't be stuck in it forever. When Crash Bandicoot 4, some might say, was cashing in on that. But all that being said and done, Brian still chose to leave. As he explained in the interview, A big reason that I left Polygon was partially just because it it becomes kind of a box in not a, a fun way when you have to be tied to something someone else created. Brian later acknowledged his fears towards the darker side of video games media. That constant fear of like, 
I I could be doing as well as can be, and I could also still get f- laid off for right. a, basically no reason, like uh, just because of how the markets work. Um, it's a it's a scary thing to be working in media that way. In particular, he bemoaned the current state of the video games industry in its treatment of its workers. I don't know if you've heard this, but some video game companies are shitty, right? Like <laughs> they are they're not great. They have bad labor practices. They have they do bad things to their employees and like it sucks to have my livelihood be tied to the work of a company I have no control over. This is especially pertinent given those earlier criticisms made towards Riot Games and towards Brian for taking payment from them. With all this in mind, his answer to why he accepted those sponsorships is eye-opening. There were tons of furloughs at Vox Media, and uh, there was one person who was laid off from Polygon um, just as a result of the pandemic. And before that, I was very not interested in doing sponsored content. I think there was that kind of moment where I was like, if I don't do this, I, I, it maybe not me personally, but like if if there is any chance for me to do these two sponsored videos and save a couple jobs at Polygon, I should do that. No one, in my opinion, should have to be put in that position in the first place. But I also can't fault him for the decision he made. I don't think I would have done any different in the circumstances. It also makes Brian's decision to leave even more understandable. Now that he can work independently with the help from his Patreon supporters, he can avoid situations like that in the future. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for Polygon. As far as I know, their wage freeze is still in effect today. If you want to help, I strongly recommend you follow Vox Media Union's Twitter page, Vox underscore Union. That way, when the time comes, we can listen to what they need and help them stand up for their workers' rights. Unraveled, more than I realised at the start, was a very careful and fraught balance between art and between commerce, and the music it used, which often bolstered both the creative side and parodied the commercial side, was itself created under similar pressure. Despite these difficulties, their work undeniably resonated with people. People like me who spent a long, cooped up year documenting the whole thing. And if you've made it this far, hopefully you too. In the end, it doesn't really matter if a playlist isn't filled in completely. Researching the songs has been interesting and informative in its own right. As Brian himself said in Unraveled's final episode, the process did imbue it with meaning for me. Otherwise this video wouldn't exist. And again, they are seriously good songs. Please go and check out the playlist if you have time. And sure, maybe it isn't every single song. But it's still great for me to stick on for a few hours and crack on with some chores. And well, that's what it was originally for, so mission accomplished. A massive thank you to Lofty Inclination, Sam Skull, and Project Marley for proofreading my script and giving me feedback and constructive criticism. This video would not be what it is without their help. Also, thank you again to everyone who pitched in with identified songs. If you were somehow inspired to try and help me find the rest of the songs, here's a link to the ones I still haven't found yet. And you can find me at Wellspoken Rambler on Tumblr and Wellspoken Tweet on Twitter. I'll make sure to credit you in the description and in my master document if you do, and I'd be immensely grateful to you for the help. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. <laughs>